Estamos buscando gente, mucha, eh, para hacer un proyecto bastante chulo, eh, eh, bastante innovador y bastante grande. O sea que el que quiera, eh, a ver que hablo bien por aquí y, y os comento si queréis donde podéis entregar los currículums, LinkedIn, etc. Y os dejo a la gente de Madrid que ha realizado este estupendo evento. Muchas gracias, José. Muchísimas gracias también a Twenty por tenernos el espacio para poder celebrar esta, esta sesión. Y nada, pues bienvenidos a todos a Madrid de Vox, iniciamos otra vez campaña después de las vacaciones y bueno, pues hoy tenemos un, un invitado de honor, la verdad que es una persona muy relevante dentro del mundo de los sistemas operativos, del mundo Unix, es eh, la persona que luego también eh, tiene el honor de haber trabajado con Netflix haciendo toda la migración hacia Amazon y convertirlo en la empresa que es hoy en día y luego pues, ha seguido haciendo muchos más trabajos. Y hoy nos viene a hablar de lo que son las arquitecturas del caos. ¿Vale? Entonces, eh, os ruego que si tenéis alguna pregunta, intentéis guardarlas para el final, ¿de acuerdo? Para que tengamos una sesión de preguntas y respuestas eh, fluida y no interrumpirle durante la exposición. Pues con esto, muchas gracias. Adrián. Gracias. Gracias por setting this up at short notice and coming, coming to this event. Very happy to see everybody. Um, I've spoken a lot of meetups around the world, so it's always good to, to be at a, a, one of these groups and uh, a DevOps meetup, another, another um, place where I've done many uh, DevOps days and meetups like that. So <coughs> I've got um, two pieces to this presentation um, because everyone always asks me sort of how did that Netflix transition migration go? So I'm just going to start off talking about that, which is more about DevOps and then I have a second piece talking about chaos architecture which is something that is currently being developed by so I'll talk about what we were doing at Netflix while I was there in 2010, 2011, 2012 and then talk a bit more about what's happening at Netflix now where they're developing this idea around chaos engineering and I'll talk about the what, why the architecture sort of you set up that leads you to need uh, this idea of chaos engineering okay So, and that may be you know, probably less than half an hour, and then we can talk and have discussions and maybe talk about some more, some more things. Um, so, I'm going to start off talking about the Netflix cloud journey, bringing it up to date with some new, <coughs> what, what did we learn from this? And what I found is that for a lot of companies, it really takes a shock before they start thinking about changing. And the shock we had in 2008 was that Netflix had a, was down for two or three days uh, due to a SAN failure taking out Oracle. It took out, all, it was a SAN virtualization layer failure. It took out all our databases at once. So all the databases were going through the same SAN virtualization switch. And we decided that we didn't know how to run hardware in data centers, basically. <laughs> that was not exactly it, but... Um, The, thing, the assumption that we had at that point was that we could make the hardware perfect enough that the developers didn't have to think about availability and operations could do their thing, developers didn't have to think about it. That was the idea. But the failure raised this question, should we make application, a way of ava application and ava availability an application level concern so that the developers had to think about how to make their applications available and then we could run on ephemeral hardware, cloud hardware, things that come and go, and not depend on the hardware being available. So this is, this is a big inversion in thinking that, that uh, many companies have gone through now, not everybody. So this is, this is part of the, the transition, right? On top of the initial question, we have a threat, an existential threat, something that's going to kill the company. In this case, it was the move to streaming and a huge increase in capacity that we were going to need. So I'm going to explain why. But we were changing the company from shipping DVDs to deliver movies to streaming. And this happened starting in 2007 when I joined. But at this point, we were starting to pick up. And what we built at Netflix was a system of engagement with our customers. And why is Netflix interesting? Why is Netflix like BMW? Why would it be similar? Because in the old days, you shipped a DVD and you didn't know what happened to it until it came back. It just comes back with some dust on it. Maybe they played it, don't know. But somebody liked it enough. 
BMW sold a car, a dealer shipped a car, they didn't know what you did with the car. Once a year you'd hear from the dealer that it came in, it has as many miles on it or something broke. Right? They had no idea what you're doing with this car. Netflix had no idea what you were doing with this DVD. When we went to streaming, we knew exactly when you watched it, how many times you watched it, how much you watched it, the bit rate, all kinds of things. And BMW now, their high-end cars are connected. BMW knows when you're driving it, how hard you're driving it, where you are. They're telling you about traffic and roadworks and the weather. All of these things are real-time information and BMW is now connected directly to its customers. This is mostly the high-end, like 7 Series BMW now, but this is going to be across the whole fleet. That's an application that BMW runs on AWS. Car as a service, car as a sensor, car as a, car as a sensor. And what Netflix built was TV set as a sensor. Because before this, the, the, the industry for delivering TV and video content delivered it to the channel, and the channel broadcast it and had no idea really who was watching, right? You had to ask a agency um, how much you could charge for the adverts because they would tell you how many people they thought were watching, right? That was, that was broadcast TV. So many industries now are directly connected to customers, right? This is, this is the big change, these systems of engagement, and the system you build needs to be on all the time it needs to be globally distributed, and it scales with the number of customers you have, not with the number of employees. Sometimes it scales with the number of things you make, like Internet of Things kind of, kind of deployments, but not with the number of factories or the number of sales, or sales outlets. It scales with the number of customers and the number of things you've delivered. That's the change, and this is why in IT now, we have this whole class of new applications which quite often are bigger than any of the applications the companies previously ran and need to be on all the time. 24 by 7, customers are going to be driving their cars. You can't have scheduled downtime where you can't drive your cars, right? So that's, that's I think, why everyone became interested in what we built. So let's look at this, the DVD business, you know, once a week on a Sunday, you would say, these are the DVDs I want to see this week in this order, and you'd send, on Monday you'd ship, put your DVDs in the mail, and on Tuesday the DVDs would come back to you. They had a very fast turnaround. It's one day, <laughs> you know, five gigabytes a day, because there's five gigabytes on the DVD. But the packet size is five gigabytes. Right? And then if you watched it really quickly, maybe you could get another DVD later in the week. But most of the time, people got one DVD turn per week was very common, right? So every month maybe you'd watch four movies or four DVDs worth. Maybe you wouldn't even get around to watching it. So then we went to streaming. We have a CDN, we're browsing the same, but this time we, we watch every episode of a show. Like at one point Netflix had every episode ever of Saturday Night Live, and I started the first episode in 1976 and just started watching Saturday Night Live as if I was in 1976. And, you know, oh, there's Coneheads have appeared and uh, Blues Brothers have appeared. And all these characters that turned into movies later appeared one by one during the shows as their characters were developed. It's like archaeology of comedy. <laughs> I just, I just for, for actually for months I would watch, you know, every night I'd watch a few episodes of Saturday Night Live to try until I got to like uh, season six where. And Eddie, Eddie Murphy turned up, and you know there were, there were a bunch of other things. Anyway, that's how far I go. So, what happens here, though, is people are now watching instead of one or two movies a week worth of content a week, they're watching easily ten times as much per week, right? Maybe more. And the number of times that the application calls the data center, you know, requests, is a hundred times more because once every minute your TV set says they got this far. There's a heartbeat, and it's saying, you're watching at this bit rate. Oh, he paused. No, he's at this bit rate now. Oh, there was a problem. You, you know, all of these things. There's a huge amount of information being sent to Netflix as you are watching the show. Quality of service, they use it to optimize to make the product better. So let's just say 100 times more. So let's, how does this work? We have 10 times as much views per week, we have 100 times traffic per view. Traffic to the data center for every customer that's streaming is 1,000 times more 
than every customer that isn't streaming, that is using DVD. So when we try to have capacity planning, when one tenth of a percent of our customers start streaming, 50-50 in the data center. Half the traffic to the data center is now coming from streaming. So we've, we ran into this going, uh, guys, we need a bigger data center. This is not going to work because we have so much more traffic. Before this, we had 25 web servers and one Oracle database behind it. And it was a big Oracle database, and there was another database that did all the logistics for the streaming, for the shipping. Um, once we got the streaming stuff, we got to a few hundred, we got to a hundred or more web servers and API servers, and we said, this is, we can't manage this. As soon as we got into cloud, we had maybe a thousand web servers, and now they are, the Netflix footprint is about 100,000 instances now, and uh, it goes up and down by 50,000 every day. So Netflix currently say they create and destroy an entire data center's worth of hardware every day. Right, because 50,000 instances is actually a normal Amazon-sized data center deployment. It's about how big a building is. We have many buildings per region, but that's a typical building for us. So they shut, they shut down an entire building's worth of hardware. So this was a problem. So we had, the choice we had was to try to hire the best people we could find and figure out how to build guess how much we needed and spend a huge amount of money building data centers, or use, this is in 2009, use EC2 and see if we could get the cloud to work for us. So this isn't one of the first times that a large company decided to use cloud as, a, as an option. Um, and we kind of decided this one, as you know, right? So what did we do then? We had some risks to mitigate. First thing, Amazon Prime already existed. It was a competitor, and we're using part of the competitor to compete with them, the other branch. So how does that work? Turns out, if you're going to compete with somebody, use the best tools you have, even if they're made by the competitor. <laughs> so if you're going to declare war on somebody and you can use their weapons to shoot at them and they're the best people, that's good, right? It's like a jujitsu move. You use the weight of your opponent <coughs> against them. <laughs> right? So that was one way of thinking about it. But what we found was that in high-level discussions, AWS is going to be a standalone business one day like separate enough from AWS, from Amazon.com that, and we wanted AWS to be really invested in the success of Netflix as a customer. And it was very important to AWS that Netflix could be used as an example of hosting a competitor. So that worked for us, we got very good support. Then we said, well, you know, we need thousands of machines maybe, what happens if you ask for it? This is in 2009. We set up an autoscaler and we set the maximum limit to 1,000 and we said, go, what happens? Hey, 1,000 machines appeared. Shut them down, okay. What happens if you ask for 4,000? Okay, we hit a limit. We told the customer, call AWS, set the limit higher. Okay, we can get thousands of machines. You know, in an hour or so, we can provision easily thousands of machines. So that was, okay, that piece works. Um, and then we were looking at the terms and said, okay, we're on a credit card and a click-through license agreement. That's not so great. That means they can shut down our business at any point if they feel like it. That's the standard term. That's so that people that have fraudulent <coughs> steal a credit card and set up an AWS account, it, it, AWS is allowed to just terminate those accounts immediately because it's in the terms of service. If we think if you're doing something that looks fraudulent, we can shut you down. But if you're an enterprise, we set up the very first enterprise agreement, which is a by commitment to keep Netflix running in return for a financial commitment for we will pay you this, this much money, we guarantee we will spend at least this much money with you over a period of time, and in return you guarantee you will keep our business running for that amount of time, you won't just cancel our account. So that's the basis of most of the enterprise agreements that companies have in AWS now, but we were negotiating the first one with the first ever AWS sales rep. <laughs> there was only one sales rep for a while, but he was the Netflix sales rep. Uh, his name is Rudy Valdez, and he currently runs the Worldwide Solutions Architect team for, for all of AWS. He's no longer, on, he went from sales to technical. But, um, and then we did this story, which was published in, in April 2010. And when this was published, people I was chatting to on Twitter thought we were crazy people, and this was never going to work, and we'd be back in our data centers pretty soon. And that was prevailing opinion. So what we actually did in 2009 was we 
did in movie encoding, all of the video encoding. This was where we needed thousands of machines. This is not customer facing, but it has large capacity. So we were able to move that out of the data center, make some space for more growth in the data center. And we were able to run this as many as we wanted, then shut it down and stop paying for it whenever we wanted. And that works well. And then we moved the back end. So the logging of all the streaming was, was killing our network and filling up the disks and killing the database that we built to serve it. So we moved logging to the cloud. Logging all the data to S3 and using Hadoop to process that data. So that the logs are, we turn the, all of the raw logs into sessions like this customer watched this movie it, over this period of time and this is their experience. So their session reconstruction, that was done as a Hadoop job running, you know, every hour or so we would go and do another block and we'd go to see what happened. Um, so this is an early Hadoop use. Then in 2010, we decided we were going to go for it and we were going to stop building any data center capacity and we had to take the Netflix plane, we had to fly it into the cloud and not leave it on the runway and hit the trees at the end of the runway. So they say you have this much runway to take off, right? You have to be up to speed or you won't fly. And what that meant was we had to, during 2010, move most of our capacity need to cloud. Otherwise we would not survive Christmas because the end of the year is the busy time. So what that really looked like was there was a data center full of front end and back end and over the year, we gradually moved front end to cloud and we put more back end. So at the end of the year, the data center was almost all back end and storage, and the front end was hosting all the cloud capacity. Right? <coughs> so the cloud was hosting the front end. And we survived, there were no outages. There's never been a capacity outage on Netflix, even with all the big launches they did, because we're always able to get more capacity in the cloud. So how did we do that? We started with the simplest possible service and then the simplest possible web page because you're debugging your tooling. You know, this is where we get into the DevOps piece, right? We, we reformed our teams at this point because when you were deploying in the data center, you know, a team would be building a jar file and they'd deploy it to QA who'd mash together all the jar files, you know, work on all the conflicts and try to generate a new monolithic build and every two weeks there'd be a new version of Netflix. So every two week update, which is reasonably agile, but when you have a hundred people developing a monolith, they start breaking each other's code. And then when it ships and it breaks, you have, call, have to call a hundred people to find out who broke it. <laughs> and that was why we went, okay, we have to break this into smaller pieces. And so we said, okay, every developer is gonna take that jar file that they were writing and they're going to build an API based, they're going to wrap it in a server, and they're going to own that service, they're going to own the API to it, and you have, to, and everyone that wants to call that piece of functionality calls an API to do it. And so the independently deployable, and that was sort of the microservice transition. We had to retrain our library developers to be service developers. And solve a few other problems. How do they find each other and stuff? So there's the Netflix open source toolkit. If you use the Java and the Spring, uh, Spring Cloud Framework, all of those tools that Netflix built are part of that environment now. Um, the other thing we did at this time was we put everybody on call in the whole company. <coughs> right, so pager duty, a call tree that starts with Reed Hastings, the CEO, and then goes down to the C-level people, and then the VPs, and then the directors, and then the managers, and then all the engineers. Because if you have an outage, you need to be able to call marketing, PR, and the executives to say we're down. You're going to be on TV soon explaining why. <laughs> right? That everyone needs to be on call. And what that meant, this was sort of our approach to DevOps from the developer point of view. We taught our developers to operate. Right? The operations team was still running the data center, and they were kind of a bit more dubious about cloud. So what we did was, and this is not usually told in the stories, but we took the develop we took the AWS budget away from the ops people and gave it to the development team so that they were paying for cloud. The developers were paying and it became a, a, a developer function doing all the cloud stuff and the ops team was still running the remains of the data center and keeping the lights on and doing that stuff. They had their own budget. So um, it was a very developer-driven DevOps transition. 
Now, sometimes you see other DevOps transitions, <coughs> say like Etsy or something, which is a very operations-driven one, where the operators learn how to develop automation and how to work more closely with the development teams. That's approaching it from the other end. And we sort of met in the middle, or there were a few arguments as we did that, as you, some of you may remember. Um, <coughs> uh, John Osborne and I are good friends now, so we are all good now. We had a few arguments on Twitter and blogs and things like that a few years ago. But the point really being that we can, all of this is DevOps. We're all figuring out how to get developers and operations to use the same tools and do the same functions, which is to keep a piece of the site running. And when you break it into small pieces that does one thing, and one person built that thing, whoever shipped it last is on call for it, basically. Well, we're doing it. And you have a small number of people, everyone owns a different piece of the site, and they're all on call for that piece of the site. It's very easy to discover what broke, and when you do many, many small shipments, you, it's very easy to roll back. You change a few lines of code, you push a new version of your server, and if it broke, you roll back to the previous version. That, that ability to incrementally roll out lots of small changes is what makes it really stable. And then the other thing was to have lots of versions running at once. So you, don't, you, have, you keep the old version while you're running the new version. You only shut down the old version if the new version can run the old and new code successfully. Right? You just keep all this running. So that was, that was the migration. Now when we were trying to do side by side, we did logins and requests, went to the data center, they authenticated, they get you back a cookie, a secure encrypted cookie. And then given that cookie, you could redirect the customer to the cloud. So once you got a login cookie, you could come in and you'd hit the data center and say, no, that web page is in the cloud, or that API is in the cloud. And you could do it on a customer by customer basis. So we had some logs we could turn to send 0% to 1% up to 100% to the cloud gradually, feature by feature. So there's a percentage-based feature flags, right? And you do it by taking the last two digits of the customer ID, mod 100. <laughs> that tells you your percentage is greater than that, right? So we, everyone at Netflix at this time knew what the last two digits of their customer ID was because, you know, if you're running at near 40% and your last two digits ended up with less than 39, you would be in cloud, your account would be in cloud, right? So, very simple technique, but we just used it everywhere to, to make this transition. And you can turn things on and off. If something breaks, you can switch back. So we're able to test out the environment very effectively. Next thing we did was data copying. We wanted to have copies of our databases in the cloud. And we built something custom at the time that copied data out of Oracle and modified it and put it into the cloud databases. And um, what Amazon has since built is a thing called DMS, the Database Migration Service, which is a productization of this idea. It takes uh, Oracle or SQL Server or MySQL or whatever you've got in the data center, and it will keep another copy of that database in sync. It's not 100% in sync, you know, it's not consistently updated, but it'll take every change and propagate it back and forth. So it, it does its best job of keeping them in sync to within a you know, few seconds something like that, which is good enough if customers are consistently seeing one side or the other, right? So we made the application tolerant to this being not entirely consistent, yeah, because of the transfer. Okay. Um, next thing, backups. Uh, in the data center, we had somebody turned up every once a week and took tapes out of the tape, uh, tape library and disappeared in the van and stored them somewhere, right? <laughs> Service. Tape archiving as a service in the cloud. When there isn't a, they, they won't let us send our little man in a van to the cloud to pick up our tapes from Amazon. They didn't have that service, so um, we figured out that we should do our archives in the cloud, and we should store all of the anything we wanted to archive. Any persistent data will be in S3 or a relational database or Cassandra archives or something like that. We will store it all in S3 and then we'd be able to do a fast restore from S3 in that region. But we also, once a day or whenever we feel like it, we take all of the archives for that day, we do a really strong, uh, we do a strong compression and encryption. Like the maximum compression to make it as small as possible and a PGP encryption on top of whatever else is already there because the data is encrypted anyway at rest, but we take the archives and do another level of encryption and we copy the files to another account in another bucket in another region. So it has to be a different AWS account 
hosted and the S3 bucket hosted in a different region. Right? Then you're safe against account takeover, any employees doing stupid things. Uh, and you make this account, this archive account, so there are no services running in it. It's just an S3 only lifecycle managed account. You know, 90 days later it will purge files. You have versioning turned on so you can't delete by writing twice. It just saves both versions. All of these things are standard S3 features. And then you create the account and throw away the keys and make sure no one ever logs into it again and you're safe, right? And it's on the other side of the country somewhere and it's encrypted, so. Just make sure you don't lose the encryption keys, that's the only thing. Okay. So this is a pattern lots of people are following now, but this is kind of, we were working through, what did we have to do? We wanted to have archive in the cloud so that we could move our back end to the cloud. And then we turned off, we moved the master copy of the databases one by one. We were basically breaking apart a really big complicated Oracle schema into lots of separate Cassandra clusters. Nowadays, probably you'd use DynamoDB. But if you pull out one table at a time into a separate, or one view at a time into a separate data source and build a data access layer in front of it. So that was the architecture. Final stage, a few years later, um, billing and corporate IT moved. The only real on-prem stuff that's in this business now is sort of Wi-Fi and desktop IT. Right? That's, that's the hardware. Uh, everything else is in cloud. All of the corporate IT moved to cloud. It's all SaaS-based, all the ERP systems, all of the HR systems.